And it's become very interesting. I can see you well, and hear you. Uh, um, I don't know if anything else is going to work at all. I don't know. I don't know. I can see you and hear you, oh. Jay. So I think there might have been other people who tried, but. Um, but we still have a meeting and um, we can uh, start moving forward. Chair, there is nothing for you to do at all. Okay. Not even changing the slides. No, we got the remote. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. But you get to sit down and enjoy it now. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, so I'll just buzz through the Pledge of Allegiance flags behind you. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for the Sixth Dance, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if you for me to in a real quick, we'll do the four way test of the things we think, say, and do. It will be fun. All right, you can be seated. Um, guests today, I only see our guest speaker. Any other guests I met? No? All right. Well, Scratchers. Thanks for that. Okay, you can click on this side. Well, this side. Okay, so whoever put theirs on the wrong side, they're not getting <laughs> This is what happens. All right, uh, we'll go quick 371 4742. Oh, right here. Awesome, John. Right. Very best. Right. 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 Uh, Perfect. <laughs> I'm living today because I I did not fall off the ladder. The ladder fell down with me on it. <laughs> so my daughter is quite upset with me today. Has gotten my <laughs> thing. I uh. Wanted to talk just for a second about the Rotary Foundation, the Boulder Flat Iron Rotary Foundation, not the big one. Um, we have not had a fundraiser or any way of increasing our foundation fund in probably 10 years. We used to collect a fair amount from birthday checks, and as we're all getting Older, our checks are getting bigger. We should be getting more, but we don't seem to be. So, anyway, to, in order to facilitate that, on the memo line of your birthday check, you have to put the foundation. And that's where it will go directly. Otherwise, it just goes into the club, which is fine. But 
that is one way to increase the foundation. And we have about $70,000 in the foundation funds right now. We have a $10,000 commitment to the 25th anniversary of our club. And we are trying to plant some trees, which is proving to be very difficult. Uh, mm. Municipal governments don't want to either do it or they don't want to let us do it for liability reasons or the fact that we will probably plant them and abandon them and they'll die. So we've got a, a deal right now with tree farms. They will plant them and uh, maintain them, guarantee them, I should say. And um, if we will plant them somewhere where there's sprinklers, then they can get some moisture. And that is the only big project we have upcoming. Um, but when we finalize that, um, We'll let everybody know, and then we'll have a fundraiser of some sort for our 20th anniversary of our club. Wonderful. Thank you, Rusty. <laughs> All right, a few announcements. Um, these are just repeats from last week. We have grants and club, grants and club qualification training regarding grants to the district on the 23rd. So Please sign up if you're interested. Um, yeah, we can skip that one. The Rotary Minute sign up sheet, we are now completely full. So, just to let you all know, thank you so much. We've got everyone on there, and I will be bugging you a couple days before just to send you a reminder, okay? Um, we have that one installation dinner right now. Anne is up in the mountain, stuck. She had three feet of snow at their house. So, <laughs> Um, she must be in that one little pocket that we saw <laughs> deep purple on the map, but uh, she's working on getting down here today, so she should be here a little bit later. Um, that said, we're possibly thinking this is for our installation dinner on the 29th, and you guys are meeting with yeah, her today. She's got the information that I need. Sure, yeah, so we're going to go check it out with them, but it, it looks more promising. Do you have a quick question, Bob? She's moved. Okay. Yeah, we'll have addresses and all of that well in advance. It's just they're they're just gonna go double check with that. And then Anne said she's working on looking at a possibility for a garage sale fundraiser, and Kim is talking to her about that. Cool. She's just trying to get here to the bowl of snow. So well, this is the time of the meeting we're doing happy bucks. So, yeah, Bill. So, I just had a quick announcement. Um, so, we have our Riley campers. I don't know if everyone saw the email. Um, we've got three uh, older ones Chloe Cruz, who a lot of you know, she is uh, Jason's daughter. She's in 11th grade at Niwa. Finn Fox, 11th grade. His mom is HR director at Google, so that's pretty cool. And Mackenzie Mallon, uh, 10th grade from Monarch High School. And our young Rylas are Alexis Ingle, 7th grade at Monarch, and Lila Baruch, 7th grade from Horizons. And I've invited them and their parents here on June 8th, for most of them are coming that day. Um, someone had a conflict, so she's going to come on the 15th. So awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate that. Okay. Happy dollar. I heard from Suzanne finally. Wow. <laughs> she says, apologize for the silence. I mostly recovered from COVID and heading out this morning on a month long fundraising bicycle and build ride. Uh -huh. We bike and then build a house one day per week, riding from New Orleans to Cleveland. It's not the three months cross country ride I was hoping to complete, <laughs> but it's a summer adventure to eight others. So I'm not sure if we'll see her here in Boulder, but, but that's Suzanne. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. The, I'm putting together the, um, the remember it's breakfast. Uh -huh. Thank you. And I don't have an address for her. Well, they did. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I wear something to remember the twenty. You got it. 
I have an address in Florida, but I think she's nowhere near Florida, so I don't yeah. know. Yeah. So, okay, yeah. I'll, I'll contact her. Okay. I think she'll prefer the digital one. Yeah, right. Uh, beautiful money. Beautiful. I'm just glad to be up here. Keep on the table. We've got extras today. Anyone else for happy bucks at the back table? Uh, I'll put in a happy buck. <laughs> Good job, Jones. <laughs> Anyone else back? Uh, George. George, I got a buck. Next week, we will be in Far Harbor and Acacia, I believe it is, Maine. Huh? And uh, my daughter's picked it up, so we've got to go celebrate graduations and stuff. So uh, that's pretty pretty happy again, I guess. It was just a little vacay. Yeah, it's for Maine. Yeah, this for Maine. Yeah, this week it's for Maine. This week it's for Maine. Lobster pancakes, lobster sandwiches. Ben, what do you got? I have a couple of happy bucks because I'm so happy to be back. Oh, Kim sent me an email and said, I hope your vacation was nice. It wasn't a vacation. I was seeing my mother. <laughs> well, we're glad to have you back. Um, the dad and Red helped herself up here. I've, I've been talking about this homeless woman from my church. She just got a promotion to the job. So she not only has gotten into a beautiful apartment, which is very nice, or a lot of dorms um, that she's sharing with somebody else, but she got a promotion. I love redemption. <laughs> this is a very, very sad. Dollar, this is a very, very pissed off, angry dollar <laughs> for Texas. Here. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it's for sure. And this table here, Terry, John, anything? No, no worries. If not, you want to donate your scratcher? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, yep, here it all. Well, I, I came from Cayucos, California, so. I had two weeks. I came, I was here in the middle between the two. So had a great time. Um, it was cold. It was not the typical beach experience, but it was still gorgeous. And I've never laughed so much with other 60 year old women. <laughs> so that's, that's my happy dollar. And I did what you said, but I'm going to need some change along the way. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Wonderful. Up later, Terry. I have lots of stitches. I still owe for the thing I didn't win. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we were in Miami this weekend, and I'm just glad to be back because I'm not my scene. Now. <laughs> well, with that said, um, we have a, one Paul Harris Award today. Um, I had better ah. some people to come, and then two of them didn't show today. So <laughs> I took one out and didn't have time to take the other one out. But we'll get on to George and his Paul Harris. Yay. Yay. Oh, it's <laughs> oh, you don't have to give a speech. You're you're immune from the speech today. But this is your Paul Harris plus one. Thank so you got a jewel on there. Thank um, you. And congratulations and thank you so much. You I know everyone here knows how much it means. So thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have a lot more to go. We've got three others. Just, uh, I mean, Katie's not here today. She, uh, she wasn't able to make it, but uh, we've got three other people who are Paul Harris is sitting in my bag waiting for them. So, with that said, we'll have our guest speaker. Bill, would you like to come uh, do an introduction? Sure. Thank you so much. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Paul Chanowski. He is a professor of civil, environmental, and architectural engineering at CU. He is currently conducting research in the areas of infrastructure adaption to climate change and high performance organizations. He has overseen the development of climate impact models for roads, rail, bridges, buildings, energy use, public health, and sea level rise. This work has been featured widely, including on ABC. New York Times, CNN, and NPR. Paul received his bachelor's and master's in architecture from Cal, Cal Poly St. Luke's 
and he received his PhD in civil engineering from Stanford. So welcome, Paul. Uh, good morning, everyone. Let's make sure it should work. I should. Oh, that remote that you're holding is my remote for my computer. That's why it's not working. So I'm happy to click forward. Use the car and that's not working. <laughs> but when you've been teaching a long time, you're kind of used to it. Eh, it works today. It doesn't work till later. Yeah. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for the invitation. I uh, love coming and doing these. Um, gets gets the day off. But everyone's always so happy when we. When we <laughs> it's like this. This is the way I want to start. As opposed to walking. If you ever eight o'clock classes, <laughs> you walk in. And it's like they're either, they either get the or kind of this glare. You know? <laughs> imagine your kids when you wake them up in the morning. Now imagine a classroom of like thirty of them. So that's an eight o'clock class. So I like coming to somewhere where people are really kind of excited and they're up and they're positive. And uh, yeah, the Texas thing really kind of that that was hard. You know? it, was like, it reminds you that. We try to be really positive about things. And there's a lot of stuff going around this that is always there. But today I'm going to talk about one of the what something that is been as my backgrounds in architecture for as long as I've had my career. We've been interested in what are offices like. And the last two years with COVID has really thrown this topic up in the air. Nobody actually knows what the office of the future is going to look like. When I was asked by the CU Magazine to talk about it, it was really talking about, I had to do more than say, I don't know, we're kind of, <laughs> I don't know, um, we're figuring it out. So we talked about it and when I was asked to come, let's talk about this, this is a fascinating topic. One, it's one that we've been talking about for a long time, right? So got, okay. So that's where we are. I want to make sure where, where are my slides? They're, they're over yeah. there. This is actually a topic, the office of the future, and we've called it for that since the early 1900s. <laughs> <laughs> we have been trying to figure out what the office of the future has been ever since we've been working in offices. It was when we had the first manufacturing sites, Industrial Revolution, it was easy. It was all about productivity. It was all about how many people can we cram into this space to produce as many goods as we could. Pack as many people as we can into the space that productivity. Ah, well, nobody complained. <laughs> I was like, okay, what a great idea. <laughs> and we did this for a very long time. Up until really, it wasn't until after World War II when we started to think about the office of the future. And the thing, I mean, next slide. The thing that really sort of was the generation of this was office furniture. We had all these new materials that were developed during World War II, new manufacturing, and we could create better workspaces. Now, I could be talking about this in 1947, 1965, <laughs> 1990. Today, same thing. I actually think the same pitch is made by the office supply salespeople. <laughs> they never update. Yeah. It's the same place, right? It's all about here we have the workstation that's going to be better for people. It's more comfortable that they want to come to the office so people are productive. And we've gone through kind of an evolution of this. And on the top right there, you see the active office. That was originally talked about in the 1950s, came out in the 1960s. The active office, chairs on wheels, we have bookcase, 
two people are going to move around to see the lower right. That was where it kind of went to the 1970s. We got there, always thinking about people moving. It's bad to have them at a desk. But if they move too much, that's not good either. Right? Because then we're lower productivity. Right? So we don't want that. So it's balance. Now we thought about office design. <laughs> <laughs> and this one, I must say, I've been pondering about a lot. Ever since I was a, a student in architecture, I've pondered this. For all the brilliance we have around the world and the things that we've created, cappuccinos. <laughs> That's cool, right? Yeah. You know, or my favorite, someone figured out how to put ice and water in the floor of your refrigerator. <laughs> what have we figured out for the office? The cubicle. How did you get into my office? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I really like the one on the right because someone has a really bright idea that if we make the cubicle a little more modern, people are going to like and it doesn't, it doesn't matter. In fact, it was really funny on Monday. I was giving a talk down in San Antonio on the you know, Air Force Base on there, and they're looking at, by sheer coincidence, I walk into the room, and there's a big sign exploring the office of the future. <laughs> <laughs> and one's like, wow, let's see what they're doing. And there was a room, it had been this size five times as long as the spice wide. Where there was every possible configuration of office furniture that you could have with a little sign, vote if you like this. <laughs> and everyone was a different version of cubicles. <laughs> there wasn't a, I don't want to be in a cubicle option. <laughs> it was, you can be in this small, lower cubicle, you can be in a big cubicle, you can be in little ones like that. What kind of cubicle would you like? <laughs> huh. Uh, and then we have the open office, the anti cubicle, right? Which you really can't tell what year this is except for the computers to change. Right? So, frankly, right, Brian, the op open office really made it popular with Johnson Wax, the building that never worked. Um, but <laughs> it looked really cool, but people hated to work in there. And we didn't learn anything. That was 1953. We didn't learn that was a mistake. And we thought again, at the upper left, you know, if we just make long tables, people will like being with each other. Sounds like psychologists involved in this We wonder, right? We wonder, right? It's just lost the work of it. Like, um, but then we got the high tech room, right? And we got like the lower left computers. Everyone wants to be in the same room and they're going to work together and they're going to collaborate. Now, I don't know how many of you have taken time. If you have maybe teenagers or college kids and watch three of them in the same room, they can be at the same table. They don't talk. Right. They all have their computers, they all have their AirPods in, and then they text each other, <laughs> sitting next to each other. Right? There's your office, right? You know, when you have an open office, what do people do? They do everything they can to not hear the person next to each other. Right? Now, it used to be a complaint, a lot of people complain, who worked in environments. What's the one thing that's hard to do in an open office environment? Phone, phone conversation. What do young people not do anymore? <laughs> Talk on the phone, right? It's not a problem, they'll buy a letter, just email and text, mm -hmm. right? Well, there's no privacy, there's no company privacy, there's no Exactly. There's nowhere to have a meeting, right? And so companies came up with an answer for that. We have a hotel uh, space, right? <laughs> right? When you need it, you can use it. I don't want to go for 
So we had COVID, <laughs> and everyone went home. And so this is the tracking over the last couple of years about office occupancy rates. And you see after COVID, we dropped all the way down to only 14% of the people were actually in office from COVID. And it slowly, slowly goes up and goes down. We were really kind of going up just before the Omicron wave came and died once again. We're now up to about 30% occupancy of office. Now think about that. How much office space are there? Let's put the other way. Almost 70% of office space is in the Oh, it, that dip in January was that below even that fourteen percent occupancy? It's, it's very it close. Was, it, it, oh. In some places, it actually went below. That's crazy. And then we had this: only four percent of employers are making their own security office space. Why do you know Great question. Where <laughs> 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 is actually the answer? The reason that they're still building offices is most of those projects were approved before COVID. Mm -hmm. And there's so much money already invested, they can't stop. Because the problem is if the developer stops, the bankers, the banks don't want. So the banks are telling the developer, you've got to finish it. And it's why, so if you, uh, people who own office space, lease office space, can't get out of their lease. Because the people who own the building still have to pay the, the mortgages on it. So you're in a stuck position. People are building offices because those projects were approved. They've got to pay off their loans. People can't get out of their leases because they still have mortgages and you're in this cycle. And so we're still building. Right? So if we look at the weekly, uh, Weekly occupancy of uh, what's going on. So, national average is about 43% of office space is occupied right now. About 43%. It's the highest it's been in quite a while. But it's very, very localized, mm -hmm. right? So, you have everything from you know, the Bay Area, 33% San Jose, New York, down to 38% office. 38% of New York office space is occupied. And 60% of New York office space is not occupied right now. Um, Houston's actually very high at 52%. The only reason I can figure that out is the weather is more miserable. <laughs> but San Francisco, right? San Francisco is the middle of where all the dot com is. Going 34%. But it is interesting. Dallas, Austin, uh, Houston are the most occupied states. I don't know exactly why. I haven't quite figured it out. Now, but it's been a while. It's a culture. It, yeah, it's it a culture. It's a culture. So, it's a culture. Yeah. In Denver, everybody needs a place to stay in the two offices that are in Occupy. <laughs> Why don't you split the building and have the rest of it? That's the really part of the rest of all my offices. That's a great question. It's really great. And, and it's actually a serious question. I mean, it, there's a lot of people looking. The answer to that one is residential buildings have different building commercial and if you're going to turn it into a residential like the most significant one is firehouse and if you're going to turn a commercial building into residential you basically have to go back and put some different uh sprinkler systems in fire engines it's not a huge deal um, but somebody has to pay for it and you do the building owners are going we're not paying for it, right? We, we'd rather wait and see if we can rent it out uh, to higher rates. Now, it's really sad 
Because the truth is, we can take one of the fairly high rise buildings in Denver that are only about 40% occupied. You could take six or seven floors in that building and with public money, essentially change it over to the residents. Mm -hmm. And you could solve a lot of house problems. And the building where, so I, I'm actually retiring from CU this summer. Okay, you're retired. So, um, I've been teaching for 27 years. I've been retiring from CU for a year of time. Um, and I'm going, because I'm um, going back to the industry, which I've been doing for a while, leading a global climate change process for a company. But we are they're in the building, a 12 story building. Only two floors of the building are empty. Nine floors are empty in the building. Okay. You could easily take that and turn it into a residence. You just have to have a phone guy and we got to focus on it and make it happen. We know the story that in the last five or ten minutes, you have not mentioned the office of the future. I doubt that you know it. Because why enough? And there's a reason you didn't do it. Because these are the factors that are changing the office. Absolutely. So we have two different types of offices. That was a great or perfect thing. <laughs> we have one type of office that Apple down the left, uh, Amazon upper left. And if they look, you, when you're at the doctor's office, and they have a little electronic thing that the doctor goes type in, you have your records, and you have your patient portal. Right. Those are primarily driven by a company called Epic. Epic is based in Madison, Wisconsin. That's their campus on the left. It, it has 10,000 employees there on their campus. It's a private company that the owner, the original founder, does not believe in people working at home. They are there, everyone in individual offices, they keep their door closed so they don't have to worry about spreading things, but that's an investment. They've got billions of dollars in investment. Apple spent $2 billion building their headquarters. Amazon uh, is spending over a billion dollars. They're not giving this space up. So you've got one side of the office of the future, which is really just over the top. Let's make office space so spectacular that people will want to come there. But the problem is we've got this other side that fewer workers say um, now say they're working at home because of concerns about coronavirus. They're actually working at home because they like it, right? They like it. So they prefer working from home. 76% of the people today, January 2022, say they work at home because they prefer it. Right? And if the request on work, if my employer insisted on me returning to my workplace full time, I would consider looking for another job. Here in the US, that's 70%. 70%. 71% of people are ages 18 to 24. The lowest percent, 55 plus, is still at 59%. People are basically saying, I'm not going back to work five days a week in the office. Not doing it. Excellent. And probably preempting what you're going to say, but what I might also read in the paper that employers are finding that they're far more productive at home. They are. They, they are. are in the office. They are. People are more productive at home. Um, and we talk, we'll talk about that in just a second. There's a couple of little things. But this is what the big challenge is for the office of the future. People are really tough thinking about climate change, resources they're using. Uh, office space uses a lot of energy, and there's a lot of push on people to, to rethink the resources they're using. COVID and other types of things, vulnerability. Okay, if you're a building owner with an office, 
you're basically facing the, the reality that at any time everybody's going to be sent home and be with them. So how much do you invest in your office? Demographics have changed. About seventy percent of people eighteen twenty four don't want to work in an office anymore. About equal percentage of that of that age group don't want to work. I was going to say, are not wedded to. They're not, they're not, they were expecting they're going to change jobs somewhere. Right? The, the days of somebody working for a company for 20 years and retiring are gone. Not any. So you've got demographic change. You've got technology development. We've got Zoom. We've got Teams. <laughs> I'm connected on my watch in a brain. <laughs> That's weird. I can walk down the street and talk on my wrist and I look like an idiot. <laughs> but technology has changed. So why are we bringing everyone to an office? to sit in front of a computer to talk to people in other rooms. That's a challenge. I think if you got a hat like Bob's, you look like Dick Tracy. So think about Very that. Often, yeah. So here's the four big trends right now, office of the future. <laughs> Make the office feel like home. Right? Have couches and make it feel like you're going home. That's uh, Human centric. Jim's my favorite all time quote about this type of office. When I was working for an engineering company in Boston, someone raised their hand in our quarterly meeting and asked the president of the company, Can we have a workout room? We work long hours and we commute. And he stopped and he looked and he said, Do you want to exercise? We have a 12 story building. Start <laughs> <laughs> Culture change. <laughs> That's the second one. Oh, yeah. Amazon. Amazon. Sustainable, right? Let's be very, let's make it feel sustainable if you're outside, right? inside, outside, sustainability. Neighborhood feeling. So you feel like a coffee shop. Instead of going to a coffee shop, let's make it a coffee shop, and then you'll feel like you're coming to a coffee shop instead of going to a coffee shop. <laughs> but we can keep an eye on you in this coffee shop. <laughs> so those are the big trends. But the issue is you have to be a big enough company with enough resources to do that. But what are they doing? They're there, there's a challenge. Seventy percent of people don't want. Seventy percent of people want to be in their office at home with their own coffee machine and couch and plants. Right? They don't want that. So just finishing up. So the challenge: Are these trends worth the risk of investing? That's what companies are asking today. Who's going to inhabit these spaces? Who are we going to? We don't know. Who is going to be there? Are we going to have half the staff there and half the staff not? Will people go back full time? I think we've hit the answer on that. I really do. That's not happening or not. No. No. Um, I actually thought it was right when my I was got as we were being onboarded to the company in 57. We were getting that was weird. Um, but yeah, they were like people work Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, Thursday. I went in on Wednesday, it was really weird. And I asked someone there, what happens in the morning with the company? Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Will companies decide? The hybrid solution saves consumer costs. Yes. They're finding people are more productive when they're at home. The big thing, so I'll finish with this. What, what do you think would make 
makes people less productive in the office. What is the one big thing? Meetings. Yeah. Commute is not actually the two, the meetings. We have lots of meetings when we're around people. We like that meeting because we talk to people. We don't say we hate meetings. Oh, we like meetings because then we don't have to do our regulars. We get to So the answer right now is the secret hybrid for most companies that are able to operate that way. Not everyone can. Not everyone can. We can't forget that. There are lots and lots of people who can't have hybrid. And um, the reason is, is the last one, everything else is just too risky. So that's the office in the future is changing. It's going to be hybrid. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be there's a very high end. You're going to have the Amazon of the world where you're going to have a lot of people trying to figure out how to cut costs. And they're going to be hybrid. Are buildings speaking up like planes with air certification? So you go into a big building. What's the difference between the new modern building like here? Yeah, there are a lot of people in there. What's the air filtration system? That's a great question. Um, the answer is some of them. So we're kind of so back in especially the late 70s and 80s, we got into this mode of we can't give people control over opening windows, right? People aren't smart enough to know when to open and close the windows. You got to keep it closed. You got to seal the building. Hmm. Well, now. What we want, open the building up, yeah. right? Uh, we use airflow, like housing. So you get people who talk about seal up their house and don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. They need to breathe. That's the way houses work. Some newer buildings, newer buildings have much better airflow. Older buildings, uh, so we might talk about older buildings. A building that's about 15 years old, that's the last generation of kind of building systems. They're about two thirds of where they should be in terms of it. So if, if somebody's sick in a building that's about 15, 20 years old, odds are everyone on that half of the floor is, is being exposed to it because it's just circulating primarily indoor. Air is not bringing enough air from the outside, so yes, it is not. It is not where it should be. Newer buildings, you know, within especially about the last ten years, are much much better. We've learned a lot. The U.S. is actually also way behind where Japan and, and Korea, um, uh, the Scandinavian countries, are buildings don't have the same airflow requirements as they do. So we're we're behind. Yeah, I have a question. Do you think that the productivity increase is because people are working more? My daughter's worked remotely for 10 years, way before COVID and now, and she's working all the time. Yeah, so that is part of it. <laughs> we're going to have a phrase on our thing. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Let's be very, it's when, when you're in an office, again, depending on where you're working, what time. I used to live in Boston because my train would get five twenty, and I said, "Hey, I got all these smart guys there to catch the train." Right? When you can hear it's a little harder, but when you're at home and it's five o'clock, it's very hard to say, "I didn't finish that task. I'll get to it in the morning." Rather than, "Well, we're just going to delay the other twenty-five minutes so I can finish that." And companies are beginning to learn. You gotta really tell people not to do that. But part of it is a little more productive because you work part of it. But people are getting smarter. People are actually taking your they're learning you can take a walk, do a phone call on the walk. People are learning their self-care. We're really people are really trying to do that. And that just cannot be this mm -hmm. slow to get in. But that's part of productivity. But the other is just you don't have people want randomly dropping in to get by your desk or your office to chat. Informal. Right, that informal meeting. You can actually put, I'm busy on Teams, and you've got an hour and a half of solid time. And that's where the big difference is. So I know that you come from the architecture side of things. How much of this would you attribute like a modern 
workplace and design initiatives from the management consulting side at their impacts on both identifying like the survey, yeah. what cubicles you like, and also their work style versus a normal traditional work style. Yeah. And then for the management consulting, a lot of times they're travel consultants or Keith Allen, and all those folks. So they come and they just take over conference room. Yep. And then leave. The, and that's been a big thing, right? Um, the management consultants together. I was going to say people who work with them. <laughs> they don't have dedicated offices in their building. They just, they're on the road so much. They come in, they have hotel spaces, they have conference rooms. And so their recommendations is always open office plans, you don't need offices, right? They're not on phone calls because they're in an office. So that has had a big impact. They actually tried to do that at CU. They came in and said, we'd be more productive if people didn't have offices. And we brought up the fact that, well, you have to have confidentiality when you talk to a student. Mm -hmm. And that was like, we couldn't understand that. <laughs> but, um, that is an impact, and it really is not every office. So, Paul, I'd like to ask now with this seismic change mm -hmm. to homework, has the, has the architecture community come up with new and innovative uh, designs for the home? That make space more usable for both purposes. Yeah, that's that. There's a lot of that now. What we're actually doing, what's actually happening now, is you're seeing home design change almost fast. So we went through a period with lots of spaces, little spaces in the house, and now it's become much more flexible as a design. You have an office space, but you have a lot more open space. So that recognizing people, the one thing people really like working at home is you can work in different places in your house, right? Mm -hmm. You have your office, but people will go sit at the kitchen table for a while. They'll go outside on the deck for a while. Or, you know, they'll move around. And so that really is really looking at much more of you have an office in the home. So you have much more open space that people can feel like they're working in a much more pleasant, open atmosphere. So that's kind of the first question out there looking at. You're seeing a lot more of these extra spaces, office spaces. So most new houses now are being designed with a dedicated office, but then a lot of open space for people can move in. So basically, as you probably are aware, very many of the houses here in Colorado are open plan mm -hmm. already. Yeah. So basically, this would just be a tweaking or an enhancement of something that's already there. Yeah. So houses here, um, especially houses that are in general, yes. Yes, you're correct. We're, we're different than a lot of parts of the country. Yeah. Right. We're, we're actually set up for homework a lot better. I could retire before I saw you and I feel so out of the main screen. That I don't know this world. I wonder if that that syndrome is not creeping into a younger group in the fifties yeah. with the office of the future driving. This partition between that's not my world anymore. Where did it go? <laughs> it, it is. I can tell you, you know, running running a team, I've got 20 year olds to us. It's very, it's very difficult when you have someone say, if I'm going to work, work remotely at this location for the next week, I just want to let you know. And your first instinct is say, what? No, you're not. We're going to is like, well, I guess it doesn't matter where, what location they're in. They're tied in on the team. And there really is this, I think people that are in the 45 to 65 age are having a really hard time 
need? What is it that that your staff says, oh, I just want to just know for the next two weeks I'm going to be in that location, so I'm, I'm going to be an hour off in the time zone. And it's like, <laughs> okay, I guess, you know, as long as you're there when I need you and you know your task, but it's, it's a different world. Mm -hmm. My husband's law firm in San Francisco went under due to this whole thing of safety. Uh, uh, everything was contracting, but they could find no escape. And my son is at Stanford Business and he studied a lot of robot flavor in medicine. I don't know if you remember that law firm. Big, wonderful law firm. But they refused to get rid of um, office space and to keep the money. And $99 over. It's an awful, but I think we're going to see more of that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So I think there's going to be a lot of companies that they're not going to be able to afford their space. Mm -hmm. They can't get out of it, and they're not going to have any choice but to close doors. I think there's a lot of that. Uh, I think the comment that Bob was talking about the past and um, I was a project manager in the financial services world and the corporate world. And in the early 2000s, one of uh, my projects was developing virtual teams between our different locations. So this is something that, you know, not really new, but uh, this is kind of fun to hear that this is kind of the idea of what you're talking about. Yeah. Hey, Dred, one last question with Joanne, and then sure. we'll be wrapping up. Do you see any gender differences in the same role or women or men? Um, this is a little bit of an age thing, so, so the kind of younger and making that up, let's say up to age 30, you really don't see much difference because of that. It's, you know, but where you really see it is that 30 to 40, that you begin to see some gender difference of. And I think it's a really good thing to start. Male workers feel like they need to be in the office a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a little bit of a relic of that's how I'm going to get promoted. I have to be willing to boss. Um, and I think that's going to fade out because we're not seeing it uh, in, in sort of that first generation. But that's a, that's an unknown. We'll you know, you know, twelve months from now we'll see where we where we are on that. So thank you everyone. <laughs> thank you for the future here as a token of our appreciation. Thank you very much. And uh maybe your new desk in the workspace is that's super friendly chat. It was very beautiful down the table. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um Bob, you have more speeches in the beach meeting afterwards? Or the speech kickoff meeting is uh, right after this meeting. If you want to participate and offer those two cents, we'll put that in. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, well, a great speaker again. Thank you. And Phil, thanks for organizing a great program today. Um, with that, it's Wednesday at the Rotary. So. I'm going to go to the